Welcome to In the Hot Seat with the Tenney Group. I'm Spencer Tenney. It's good to be with you. What in the heck is going on with trucking tech right now? With me to address that longtime industry veteran and constant innovator in the trucking space, Glenn Spangberg. Welcome to the Hot Seat. Thank you, Spencer. It is great to be here. Uh, I've been following the Tenney Group for some time, so it is a, a pleasure to meet you and your audience, and I'm looking forward to the uh, to the interview today. Well, likewise, sir. And uh, I don't even know where to begin, but but here we are. We'll just we'll just go for it. So before we kind of heat things up, would you just tell our audience a little bit about what you're working on right now? Yeah, you bet. So my focus is on high tech trucking technologies. Uh, things that really move the needle in terms of how it affects the company's operating ratio and in trucking, this is a very big opportunity space, especially these days with the price of fuel and the opportunity in the onboard computing space and uh, the ability to really tackle some, some difficult problems in the trucking industry using a, a new brand of technology. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fun venture and it's actually with a company called Platform Science. And there's some really cool things that are happening in that space as the original equipment manufacturers choose this as really one common platform for their onboard computing uh, needs. But what it does is it opens up the opportunity for fleets uh, to use that exact same platform that's coming out. It's a standard in the marketplace these days. It's gonna be more uh, ubiquitous as the, uh, the OEMs begin to roll out the trucks with uh, the system installed and, uh, and running on it. Uh, so looking forward to some great things uh, yet to come. Well, I love that. So so for the benefit of our audience, when we back up a little bit, let's go back into history a little bit, Glenn. You know, I kind of mentioned this 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 uh, pattern of innovation around tech. Tell us about the genesis of that. How did you even get in involved uh, as far as uh, freight tech? Yeah, absolutely. So it really goes back to my childhood in 1973, the Boy Scouts of America announced that they were uh, launching a new merit badge called the Truck Transport Merit Badge. And I was immediately uh, interested in doing that. I'd actually been sort of chasing down trucks uh, even from my youngest stages as I climbed all over trucks at Mr. Long's International Harvester dealership in uh, Parsons, Tennessee as a very young boy. Uh, and of course, when this merit badge came out, I was all over it and, uh, and earned it and, and proud of it. But I fell in love with the industry right then and there. And then post-collegiately, I joined a company called ComData Corporation. Uh, very excited to be on the technology side of trucking as ComData looked to leapfrog Western Union way back in the day. So this was in the mid eighties uh, and make it easier, more efficient and really ultimately more profitable for carriers who need to give cash advances to truck drivers. And then it moved into the new things like the fuel card. And uh, Don Frymiller wrote about me uh, in his uh, book in, uh, about trucking uh, in terms of how we innovated around things like how to settle with owner operators after they uh, conclude a load and how do you do that most efficiently and do it in a way that creates uh, traction between Fry Miller and the driver themselves so because they're independent, they could go anywhere. So really creating an environment where the driver wanted to choose in that particular case, Fry Miller, but it went on to be a very successful product launch, new product introduction uh, for driver payroll. And that morphed into things like a phone card and the ability to pull cash out at ATMs and really turned out to make not only the carrier more efficient, but the driver, uh, the driver's life more uh, engaging as well and, and more efficient uh, in terms of life on the road. So that's where it started. You know, the, the more that I've done my research on you, Glenn, it's almost like you're, you kind of have this who's who's list of your collaborative partners throughout your career. And I'm curious, like who, who's had a profound influence on you as, as you've kind of, you know, since 1973, getting your merit badge for trucking, like who along the way is, has, has had a profound influence on you? Wow. Well, so did the men and women who've launched these trucking companies have really had the most profound influence. And if I uh, were to choose the, the number one, I would have to go with uh, Max Fuller, uh, which he's a founder of US Express and uh, the immediate past executive chairman. Of course, that uh, acquisition by Knight Swift was hats off to all of them for making that happen. But Max was a, a gentleman that I met early on in my career, uh, probably right at the start the founding of his uh, of his company, U.S. Express, 
uh, and that had a bit of background with Clyde Fuller. Max's dad just kind of fell in love with the family, but Max was really one of those forward-looking, innovative thinkers. Uh, and in fact, I'll even say, I know we're going to chat a bit about my mirrorless truck story, but the origin of the placement of those displays on the inside of the cab and where they're displayed and why they're displayed where they are. Ken, we'll chat about that in a minute. But that was inspired by Max Fuller. Um, back in that day, he said, you know, there's a lot of thought about putting this display down in the center. Uh, he said, but I, I don't agree with that. I think it needs to be in the natural line of sight and above the dash line. So he not only thought about it from a technology perspective, but also from a safety perspective. But back then, and I want to say that that was the uh, mid to latter uh, 1990s, wasn't quite 2000 when he and I had that first conversation, but I never got it. And uh, and it turned out to be a big inspiration for, you know, what became my my mirrorless uh, truck uh, concept that I copyrighted and, and published. So so since you brought it up, sir, let's let, let's talk about that. What, what... What, what is the story behind the mirrorless truck? Yeah, you bet. So in 2012, I was sitting on the future truck committee uh, and Paul Minig was leading the, uh, the subcommittee called New Horizons. And he was chartered with leading us to think about what the future of trucking looked like. And one of the topics that came up in 2012 was about autonomous trucks. Uh, and about how quickly we could get, you know, autonomous trucks implemented and, and how it would, you know, save the day in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, the driver shortage and things like that. And, of course, the efficiency of freight movement. And I openly, I didn't agree with the position that we needed to be pursuing driverless trucks. My position at that point was that we needed to look at the technology that will enable those trucks to be safe on the road and pull forward as much as we can technologically and create an environment where we're using subsets of the technology to make a safer experience for the driver, giving them better information faster to inform their, their driving. And uh, so I made that mention in 2012, Duke Drinkard uh, from Southeastern Freight Lines, retired now, uh, but he was the chairman of the Future Truck Committee at the time. And uh, and he just made a, a very um, innocuous statement. Well, you know, Glenn, show us, you know, at some point what you're thinking there. But in the meantime, let's keep talking about the future truck and the future of trucking. Yeah, but I took that as a, a spark of um, of interest. And it wasn't long after that, as I was pondering this, that I began to, to I'll say, see, it wasn't a freaky thing, but sort of have these visions of, you know, the truck with no mirror and using cameras and then i all of a sudden i was seeing the displays that you know if you if you did it just right it'd be natural for the driver look left to go left look right to go right had a certain vision about that right side look down with that being really kind of the no zone and one of the most dangerous sides of a of a heavy duty truck and really envisioned having a system that would see everything that's going on in the right side of the cab of the truck so that if you have a motorcycle that's in the driver's a blind spot or, you know, camping right near the right fuel tank or anything along those lines, you know, if you gave that driver the information in an environment where it's natural for them to understand that they've got something, uh, you know, in their mirror, then it would help them uh, become much safer. So that ended up being what I conceptualized. I hired this uh, young man, Chris Bolden, uh, who was one of the storyboardists for the Simpsons series, and they stopped doing the Simpsons series. So he was between uh, jobs. And so I asked him to come over and hear the vision that I have and help me put it into a storyboard, which he did. And I, I copyrighted that. He's now doing um, uh, Rick and Morty. Uh, so he's still doing story storyboarding, but he'll forever be a part of this, uh, my mirrorless truck story. But that was published and it was done in 2013, officially copyrighted. So I own those copyrights and those images and I kind of Kind of a fun little story there. No, and and you throw in the Simpsons with it, and it just you're like, <laughs> that can't be real. That it, it's so I love that. Well, let me add this, if I may. So there's an Easter egg uh, in the uh, the mirrorless truck story that I've got on my LinkedIn, uh, and if you look closely at one of the images, Bart Simpson is actually sitting in the driver's seat. Now you know, it's, hopefully the uh, statute of limitations is has uh, passed by. He, did, he really didn't want that to be pointed out at the time. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but it is kind of a fun little uh, Easter egg to be planted into the uh, 
no, I into the images. I love that. I'm going to go check that out, sir. You know, so that, like multiple iterations of you kind of being on the cutting edge of some of these innovations. And so I'm, I'm wondering uh, from your vantage point, like today is, you know, different from the late 90s. It feels like there's just so much technology available that's almost overwhelming uh, for a lot of folks that are trying to innovate. They're trying to make good decisions, but it, but it's almost, uh, where do I begin? So, 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 so what, what have you seen, you know, observing at the business owner level? Like, what are the, the, the folks that are, you know, taking ideas to action, they're choosing the right technology for their needs? Like, what are their best practices? How are they thinking about technology and then implementing the right technology for their business? Yeah, the, the best practice that I see really day in and day out for decades is a, a strong leadership team that understands what their priorities are and what the key initiatives are that they believe will help them to achieve those goals. Typically, their annual goals, uh, you know, go into third quarter, fourth quarter, you know, typically uh, into a, a strategic planning phase, uh, and they'll do their budgets at that time and, and whatnot. But what I found is, is if you sort of uh, press in before that process begins and have executive level conversations about what they need to do to move there, typically it's an operating ratio or it's a return on assets uh, or, you know, or two key metrics in the trucking industry that are focused on. But I like to discover sort of what, you know, where, where are you going to push your emphasis, not from a technology perspective first, but from a problem uh, and, uh, and priority uh, reference point. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, recently had a a client who was saying, look, we have got a problem with on-road breakdowns that we have that we have to fix. And so in doing a bit of deep dive and discovery there, if you look at some of the contributing factors to on-road breakdowns, you'll find that preventative maintenance are typically running overdue. Mm. And so what we discussed was is if we could read through the TMS into the maintenance program, we can take a look at overdue or, or upcoming PM uh, appointment requirements, we could schedule that into the driver's workflow at the proper time based on origin destination of the load, how much dwell time they may have in that load, and then the the uh, relative coordinates of the terminal that will be doing the preventative maintenance. We pull that PM in as a stop for the driver so that when they're na navigating, I'll use this example, they arrive at a location, they pick up a trailer, they begin to navigate. All of a sudden, they discover that they're navigating to the second stop, which happens to be XYZ Trucking's terminal. And the stop details include what kind of PM the driver is going to go through. So literally, it becomes a day in the life of the driver that all of a sudden now those overdue PMs go from you know 50% of the total fleet at any given time being overdue now to really there's no reason why any of them should be overdue you just change the window of when you start looking at it so instead of two weeks in advance go three weeks in advance mm. you can fine tune it using the technology to ensure that you then get the pm overdues under control and the outcome of that is with a few other things that uh, uh that i won't get into right now all of a sudden now you've got fewer on-road breakdowns as a result of implementing a, a technology solution like that so that's looking at a big problem uh, with a with a clear technical answer that institutionalizes the change and ensures that it can be you know measured, observed, uh, and improved, fine tuned. I mean, I think that's pretty remarkable, just about how simple and elegant like that solution is. And and I'm curious, like like so, so when when someone's looking at that, let's uh, for you know small mid sized fleet. I mean, when they look at the that tech, the technology and how that provides the solve for that problem i mean what, what kind of cost savings are we talking about in that situation i mean like per incident or per fleet like what like what, what have you observed about what that technology actually is accomplishing yeah so when you when you focus first on high value high volume transactions first of all you're really setting yourself up for a, a fairly tremendous improvement if you get the solution right so if you dial it in just just correctly the the question about how much savings really has to do with the volume and the value of the problem that you're solving so you know if it's doing uh 
you know, in the case of on-road breakdowns, you might move the operating ratio an, an entire percent by improving that. You could potentially move it 2%, um, which when you're talking in the competitive world of trucking, you know, getting the 2% gain on your operating ratio, there's quite a bit of money that can go to the, to the bottom line. And if you're talking about fuel and improvements in fuel, so using things, fuel coaching, for example, that's real time that helps the driver understand, you know, when they're getting the foot into the accelerator a bit too much or not coasting properly in downhills and those sorts of things. In real time, that money, those efficiencies and fuel savings flow directly to the bottom line, and those can move the needle, you know, in, in, in today's economy, uh, two to three percent in terms of how it affects the operating ratio. So it really depends on what the problem is you're solving, how many of them you solve, and what the total uh, value associated with each one of those problem sets looks like. So I'm curious, there, there's a, a variety of different categories of you know, um, problems that technology is trying to solve for. What, what is a category that you see that maybe you're just extremely excited about as far as what, you know, that the industry is making available in terms of solutions? I mean, what, what's really just got you pumped up right now? Yeah, right now I'm, I'm kind of big on uh, things related to vehicle uptime performance mm -hmm. and the ability to, uh, tap into the sensors on not just the tractor, but now on the smart trailers. And so producing really accurate, timely data sets like that uh, is the first part of it. The second part is what we're seeing in back office innovation with artificial intelligence driving things like the prognostication of potential failure in a truck because of a certain set of fault codes that have been coming off the truck for a certain period of time that correspond with the high likelihood of failure. And the really cool things, you know, when we look at uh, the three announcements in the example of, uh, of uh, Platform Science, you know, they've signed uh, 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 Cascadia for the, uh, uh, the Daimler for the uh, Freightliner Cascadia. They've signed Navistar for the international truck. It's exactly the same software platform, so it's all enabled by platform science. Uh, and then most recently, Packard announced, uh, you know, what they're doing with the Peterbilt and Kenworth going to the exact same platform. So now there's no mixed fleet issues to deal with. The data sets are fairly common, and each one of those OEMs are looking at it through a very technical lens to ensure that their vehicles are really performing to the highest potential standard. When you when you look at what causes return on asset to begin to fall, it's when those assets don't turn on and run uh, properly, or if they run properly and then they they break down halfway. Those are you know those are surmountable issues these days. And so I'm really liking what I'm seeing uh, in terms of how fleets are, are working with the OEM to understand how the vehicles are performing. Also, some of the aftermarket. Uh, AI tools that are out there that will take the same data set for a carrier and give them some of the deepest insights about the performance of their tractors in the real world. And they can correlate things like, you know, load weight, uh, the age of the tire, the uh, assets that were uh, allocated, and they, they can tie it all together and look at it through every single permutation and identify things and, and the whole goal and all that's narrow the variance and shift the mean mm -hmm. right so you narrow the variance of you know uh, of issues and challenges and breakdowns that thing get some clarity in terms of what the data is showing and then you can start to move upstream as you adjust the dials to performance and you can see real impact uh coming through the numbers so i think vehicle uptime performance is probably number one number two i would say that is going to be fuel uh, so when you got assets that are running, you might as well make them efficient. Uh, I really love what MBT Technologies has done and Daryl Bear and, uh, you know, and his focus on really understanding the true economics of fuel performance uh, across a whole host, a myriad of different uh, tools or capabilities or new things that could go on the tractor or trailer and all of that. But he's got it down to a science. So I really like uh, how data is informing, again, narrow the variance on your fuel performance within your fleet. Don't fluctuate between six and eight, you know, get it to where you're between 7.2 and eight, and then begin to shift the mean of performance, moving it up. And there is always room to move up in fuel performance. 
And I know Brent Nussbaum will tell you exactly the same thing. They are always and constantly pushing the envelope uh, in the performance of these vehicles to, you know, to wrench out another, you know, penny a mile in terms of uh, uh, savings in fuel. Well, I think that's, that's so fascinating. Let, let, I'm, I'm curious, what, what's your take in terms of where we're at in terms of this movement towards electrification? Where are we? Where, where do you see this going? Well, I, I see right now the cart before the horse. I, I, anytime the government gets out in front of the, the industry, what? you know, and the knowledge, I know, right? <laughs> Who'd have thought that? Well, that's exactly what's going on. And frankly, you know, with, with, uh, with Jim Mullen, now getting involved in the uh, you know in the, the the whole conversation about the environment and and uh, trucking technologies and and that's a great move for him and uh, and I know that there's some other folks that are really contributing to that. Andrew Boyle had a great uh, appearance on Capitol Hill recently uh, talking that. about this very absolutely. But I'm I'm all you know frankly I'm a big Andrew Boyle fan in terms of uh, the way he's looking at this particular problem. Uh, and same with Derek Leathers at Warner uh, and many other leaders. I mean, there, it's we, we got to stop getting the cart before the horse. It needs to be a an industry. I'll call it a grassroots effort, although there's you know that probably oversimplifies it. But a grassroots effort to come with you know really viable alternatives that that have a lot of uh, you know uh, input from not just the carriers and the government, but also from the OEMs and you know uh, and, and that sort of thing. But do we need to get there? Sure. Are we ready to tomorrow? No, not at all. In fact, you can lump those and autonomous trucks probably in the same bucket and say, you know, great promises, but you know, it's a it's a long tail on this dog, and we, we got to figure it out. Can we? Yes. Can we do it tomorrow? No. So you know, chill the jets and let's just stay focused on it as a priority as an industry, and I think we'll still get there. And hopefully, that sums it up with very little controversy. No, I I think that's pretty. Pretty wise right there, sir. I got, I got one last question for you. A little bit of a, a wild card here. I, and you really inspired me talking about young Glenn being a Boy Scout, and he's getting this badge. He's on, a, he's on his way to a whole new journey and adventure within trucking 50 years. So I'm curious, 50 years removed, what advice would you give to young Glenn upon receiving that merit badge for trucking 50 years ago? What would you tell him about it? About having a how to have a successful career in trucking yeah I, I would have never thought this i i find that i am truly blessed and i mean that with all my heart um you know the gifts and talents that i was uh, granted for whatever reason i am very thankful for uh, the passion that i have for the industry i would say you know dial up the passion uh care more about the people than you do about anything else in in the industry uh, which I've been, you know, careful to do. I'm proud to have built my reputation on, on excellent service. It's not perfect, but, uh, you know, still quite excellent. So I would say, you know, keep that as a, uh, in, in the forefront of your, your heart and your mind as you labor. I would say, remember, people are the reason why this industry is so fun and so good to one another. Uh, we care about each other. You know, it's a good, uh, it's a good family environment. I spent two years out of trucking when I was at Qualcomm uh, from 2004 to 2006 as the launching a Flow TV, which is a large format broadcast to the cell phone before Wi-Fi. And I uh, was successful on that launch. We signed Verizon to uh, you know, a multi-billion dollar agreement and, and also Singular before they were bought by AT&T. That was fun, but it wasn't family. What I learned from that two year experience outside of trucking was how much I love trucking. So when I came back into it, you know, the, the visions kept coming and you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the, the Maryland's truck. So I'd also tell my young self, be looking for that, but maybe do it a little bit different. Um, wrap a few more uh, protections around the idea, but uh, I'm still proud that it came out. Uh, focus on safety. I would also give myself that advice and, uh, you know, and, and just, you know, love people, care about their business and, and help them achieve what they are looking to achieve and everything will work out fine for you, young man. Well, I, I think that advice could be directed to just about all of us, Glenn, and I really appreciate that. I love what you said. It may be fun, but it's not trucking. So, that's right. So, that's right. Well said. Hey, that's going to do it for us in the hot seat, sir. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing all of your insights with our audience. We will see you next time.